What's up, everybody? I'm Jared Faber. I'm a composer, producer, songwriter. We're here in my studio in Silver Lake, Los Angeles, California. And I'm going to talk about a little bit about what I do and why I use sound iron samples. The coolest part for me about being a composer is the collaboration and the connection with the other artists that I work with. Um, even though inevitably when I'm working on a project, I'm always very aware that the, the directors, the producers that I'm working for, while they're uh, ultimately my boss on the project, I always feel like we're kind of, we're just collaborating and we're making something together and we're a team. And a lot of the artists that I've had the, the opportunity to work with really work that way. Um, in particular, uh, Emily Kapnick, who I work with on um, Splitting Up Together, who's the executive producer, you know, is a very involved in music type of person. And, you know, we, I feel like we create the sound together as I do with Peter Michael on Teen Titans, as I do with um, Peter Hastings on Captain Underpants. I think I first got into music just via wanting to play guitar. Uh, I've been playing guitar and taking guitar lessons for a while. I saw the Chuck Berry documentary, Hail, Hail, Rock and Roll. And I was like, oh, dude, I want to do that. I think that whole movie just kind of inspired me because it included all kinds of different artists and Keith Richards and Eric Clapton and Ed James and all these people. So I was like, man, I want to be part of that. When I watched them get together and collaborate and jam, I was like, I want to do that. I want to, I want to just make music with people. But I was always interested in recording. I was always interested in production. I was always interested in a variety of music. You know, I had my drum machine and my four track recorder and I was making silly songs, which ultimately is basically what I do today. I make silly songs. Another project I'm working on is Splitting Up Together on ABC. Uh, and that's a project that I collaborate with a longtime friend of mine, Emily Kapnick, who's the creator of that show and the executive producer. And um, I think one of the things that's really exciting about that is just, it's just that the attempt to always bring the soul to it, the heart to it, and that's what it needs. It's an emotional show mixed with comedy. I do as much as I can, it's all live recording. Um, we're using real piano, real drums, real guitar. It's not highly orchestral. There might be a little bit of strings, but it's mostly sort of a, um, you know, band-based, pop music-based thing. And it's, so it just comes down to the performance. It's not, I'm not programming something. It's not epic. It's just, it's intimate and it just needs to sound good. The, I think the main challenge with splitting up together um, and the main approach, we're always trying to put some genuine emotion into the music and really make you feel something, uh, which ultimately I think is always the point of music. I think that is the function of music, is to make you feel. A movie I recently did was um, Teen Titans Go to the Movies. That came out this past summer. And um, I've talked about that a little bit and we, we've, we had so much fun on that movie, you know, because the movie was hilarious and musically we got to be all over the map as far as like the epic orchestral scoring on the action stuff. And then we had uh, musical collaborations with all of the cast. Plus we had uh, Michael Bolton doing a song. We had Lil Yachty redoing uh, uh, our main Teen Titans sort of theme song within the, within the movie. Um, and it was great. It was great. We just got to make records on top of score. And it was just, uh, it was the real deal and it was fun. I, I had a very, very nice experience with everybody on that movie. And um, there were some people who I wanted to um, give an extra uh, thanks to. So I, I had a few of these guitars made and um, was able to uh, share a few of them with uh, a couple of the, the producers and directors and important people on the movie. Everyone on the movie was important, but there were certain people who I was able to share a guitar with. And this is fun. Um, to be perfectly honest, I don't really play it a lot, but I like it. Uh, you know, I think when I was starting out, I wasn't really differentiating between score and songs and theme songs versus uh, other songs or, you know, I was just like, let's make music. like. 
where can I do that? Who's going to let me do that? Will anybody pay me to make music? Um, and some of the first opportunities I had in TV, just doing a song was part of it, especially because a lot of that stuff was animated, uh, kids-oriented stuff where songs are a part of it. Um, so I started doing theme songs, like I did the when I did As Told by Ginger, we did the theme song with Macy Gray, um, and then I wound up doing a theme song for uh, Clifford's Puppy Days, and then did the score for that. And then I started working on records as well because I just really enjoyed the song part of it. Also did the Boss Baby theme song recently with an, an often collaborator of mine, Cool Kojak, and he and I have have done records together. And um, you know they wanted a, a hip hop rap song uh they wanted it to feel they they had some very specific indications about it having some brass and having it feel like because it's about a baby who is like a kind of financial boss or whatever so they had they wanted to financial language in this rap song um and uh, my my favorite uh, my favorite lyric that we dropped in that was, uh, my duty is fiduciary. Mary! My duty is fiduciary. The nerds want to know. Uh, yeah, well, here's the thing. You know, when you're doing TV music in particular, film music as well, but TV music you're on, it's all about time. It's all about how quickly can you make something sound good. So I kind of have my whole studio set up for efficiency, basically. So I'll give you a little, uh, a little tour of what I got going on here. Um, I am not a hoarder. I, um, what I like to do is not hold on to things that I find I don't use. But I do find that I can use little things here and there to get a little, get a little creative juices flowing. So here's what we got. I am a guitar player, so I got a lot of guitar-centric stuff. I got some pedals over here. I like pedals. I've always liked pedals. When I was younger, I liked pedals. I still like pedals. I got my amps over here. I'm going to start with this amp here, which I don't use as much as I should, but it is really, really awesome. This is a, an Oahu amp that was a match with a, um, uh, a lap steel guitar that I have, um, but I just like it on its own. I love plugging my, my like jazz guitar into it. I love how that sounds. Uh, old 60s amp. Um, I got some synths over here, which I don't have a ton of synths. I don't feel like I'm a big synth guy, but I do feel like when you can infuse a, your productions with a little real analog goodness and not do it 100% in the box, I do feel it makes a difference. I got an old Juno 60 and I got a Juno 106. These are just I just feel like they do it for me. Those are pretty much the sound that I need a lot of the time. I got over here my, my rack of mic pre's and, and kind of saying earlier, I liked it. I've, I kind of have everything set up in the studio where it's all normal and uh, into my patch bay and into channels of Pro Tools. Guitars, um, I like them. I've always liked them. That's what I do. I got my, uh, my sitar guitar. I've got my... Um, uh, my uh, my Venezuelan Cuatro that I bought in Colombia, not in Venezuela, but it is a Venezuelan instrument. And then I've got my Cuatro Puerto Ricano, my Puerto Rican Cuatro that I got in Puerto Rico. Um, so these these you know all this stuff comes in handy. I got my 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 band guitar over here, which is like a uh, oh it looks like a string broke on it, but it's like a guitar that's a, a banjo that's strung like a guitar because I don't really uh, play the banjo but I can I can get by on the guitar and uh, so I do that you know other other random doodads that find their way into projects and I guess everybody kind of collects these things around their studio because ultimately when you when you use a little something that everybody doesn't have no matter how simple it might be then you've got your thing. Then my first year in LA, man, I found these guys right here. This 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 pearl kit, which is which looks like an old Ludwood kit, but something's rattling around inside there. I saw them at the Melrose flea market. Um, it was like I was in LA for you know maybe uh, six months at that point, and I ran over to them without even thinking. I was like, I'm buying those drums, man. I'm gonna have drums now that I live in an actual house. You know, my amps are plugged in and miked and they are normal to particular inputs. All I have to do is 
hit record, grab a guitar and go. I got my piano is mic'd. My drums in the booth are mic'd. I have another drum set out here that's mic'd. I've got some synths over here. Um, so all of that, all of my instruments that I like to use, uh, the out of the box instruments are all set up and ready to go. So I don't have to do any patching. I don't have to figure out, I don't have to get levels on anything. It's all set and ready to go. So that's one of the things I do to just kind of keep things efficient and flowing and allow me to be creative and just grab things without having to take the time to just get a sound out of it first. Some things that are really fun to have around are things like, uh, like this, man, this. You gotta have one of these. And if you don't have one of these, then you need something similar. You just need some... You just need some fun stuff that you can, you know, just cost a couple of bucks. Found it a little art side of the road thing. A guy was making these guitar, these guitars out of cigar boxes. I was like, oh my God, I need this. And I've used it on shows. I've used it on splitting up together. And I've used it on Captain Underpants. It works apparently both for live action and animation. So this is my this is my template for Captain Underpants, and um, you know we got our drum core thing here, um, and then I've just got got a bunch of other sounds that we use throughout the show here. From you know I kind of I got my color coding here for my we got my the strings, and we got that all broken out by you know section and articulation and all of that. We got our we got our choirs, we got our uh, we got our brass, same color coded articulations, all all separate, and then I usually have a bunch of audio tracks that are are all normal to things that are plugged in around the studio. So if I want to grab a guitar, it's automatically going to come right into my my amps are in the booth over there, and they're mic'd up. I got my preamps. I don't have to touch them because. The levels are all set. Um, I use this controller here and I always lock uh, the first three channels to click dialogue, uh, sometimes the uh, temp sound effects, temp music if I need that, so that I can easily uh, you know, turn the dialogue on or off or down or click on or off uh, or up or down. Um, that's sort of a key thing. I just started uh, messing with this thing called Stream Deck that my buddy Fred Crone, who's my partner in this project, uh, gave me as a gift. So for example, I press my drums and it opens up all the drum channels that I have for my drum set mic'd up in the booth, plus the bus that they're going to, plus the VCA to control them, and there they are. Um, so, you know, I think like a lot of uh, composers nowadays, anything I can do that can save a, a few seconds here and there, just kind of keeps things moving. It keeps things, uh, keeps me focused on making the music and not on uh, instantiating plugins or wiring things up. And, you know, I just, I just try to keep everything at my fingertips. I mean, it starts with sort of, you know, conversations with the, with the, collaborators with the directors and producers and you know kind of figuring out what they have in mind for a sound maybe they don't have a something in mind so I'm kind of looking at it and seeing what it makes me feel as we start landing on particular instruments they become part of uh, my palette for example on the Captain Underpants uh, show uh, one of the one of the key elements is this marching there's a it's a it's a school band sound we we landed on as one of the one of the main elements. And as a band that's supposed to not sound too good, it's supposed to actually be like a kid band, like a middle school band or something. We got some woodwinds and we got like some drum core type things. Um, for the drum core stuff, I'm using the Sound Iron Drum Core Library, which is perfect and probably the only uh, such sample library for what I need that happens to be out there. So that's a really good example of like how we set it up. And every time I open my template, for Captain Underpants, I got the drum core, I got my woodwinds. I can show you a couple examples of how I use this, um, the drum core library, uh, which is awesome. And it's so, it's got such big, I love that bass drum sound. Um, but it's kind of a big piece of uh, the sound on, on, on Captain Underpants, 
because the whole concept of the of the comedic element of the scoring is all supposed to sound like a school band, uh, probably like a middle school band. So you know we've we've recorded some like live woodwinds and um, mixed with our synth orchestration, but we use this drumline thing, which we just love. And there's, there are these chapter cards that happen uh, throughout the show where they say, chapter two, blah, 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 blah. And it, that's sort of like the signature thing as we use the. So we love that. But then we, we, we have these cues, and let me find one that's uh, appropriate. That we love. A five hundred. Let me mute the dialogue. That's one of our. Uh, it's one of our classics. We love that one. Uh, here's just the drums. Couldn't do it without that library. Uh, and we, we will then like add that sound into, uh, into other cues that might be a little bit outside of the, the, the marching band genre. And I was just about to work on one. I'm gonna find it for us right now and I'm gonna add these drums. Yeah, I'm gonna do it right here. This wasn't the one we were dealing with. Here's a cue that I have, uh, I have a, an almost completed cue. The last thing it needs is, uh, a little of this drum line. When I say it's the last thing it needs, I don't mean that's the last thing it needs. I mean the last thing that we need to do. And this is how the pros do it, a little of this. All right, I'm gonna to try to perform that right in here. Uh, let's see what we got. Should we quantize? We might quantize. I could make that better at the end. Probably should just end there. Should we put a little roll right before that last one? Probably should. that. Oh, I love it. I'm right, running it right here in Pro Tools. I'm not even bothering to throw it into Vienna. On other shows, it might be more acoustic instruments. It might be like, as soon as I open the template for splitting up together, I got channels already set up for my piano for two to four acoustic guitars, a couple of electric guitars, Mellotron, Wurlitzer. One of the first bands that I ever heard that really turned me on was the Beatles. I think that's pretty common for probably a lot of people. Um, then I started listening to like blues, but I originally, I kind of got onto blues via Chuck Berry and via like 50s rock that my dad had turned me on to. Um, but that quickly went toward B.B. King, Buddy Guy, all of those cats. And then, uh, you know, that sort of, sort of brought me into the world of West Montgomery, which took me into the world of Charlie Parker and ultimately Train and Miles. And then I was kind of like really focused in that direction. But all along, I think the music that I always came back to was songs. It was always about that. And then that would be, you know, for me, that could be Stevie Wonder, that could be Paul Simon. Um, God, we could go on and on, right? I mean, there, I'm not naming, um, not naming anybody particularly obscure. It's really, you know, the music that I heard growing up on the radio, you know, Hall and Oates. My mom, I can remember my mom listening to Hall and Oates in the car, and when I was a kid, and like to this day, like that music resonates with me. You know, I was recently asked what would a dream project for me be and I felt like I felt like this was going to maybe come off as you know disingenuous but the reality is like the best projects are like where the people that I'm collaborating with 
are are great where i'm where i feel like i'm just vibing with them they appreciate what i'm doing i respect them they're making amazing art and i'm getting to be part of it um you know for example i work with uh i have a, I have a project called war and pierce with uh two great great artists sunny war and chris pierce uh, we're about to start doing a record. It's a dream project because they're just amazing. And when we sit down and make music, it just, it just flows. You know? But it's it's the same thing for me when I when I work uh, in in TV and film. It's like when the people that I'm working with are creative and and just so smart. Uh, that's a dream project. Um, I've been lucky enough so far to work on enough projects that I I don't at the moment feel like, oh, I'm just dying to do this one thing if somebody would just give me a chance. Um, it's just, I'm always looking to work with people who are great and people who I can connect with. I've got a booth over here, which I used to mostly use for vocals. Now I primarily like to do vocals right out here where I can just be right next to someone and talk to them and not have them feel like they're locked in a thing where they have to wait for talk back to know if people are commenting on their performance. I just kind of like to be right there with them and uh, I feel like it's it's just more intimate and more connected. You know, I know there's a lot of people out there who are, you know, younger uh, musicians coming up and looking to, to to do this type of work. And I I think what's allowed me to sustain a career has been, you know, being open to it, um, being open to what it, you know, trying different things that come my way. Um, I, I am all for knowing what you care about and going for something full on. If you're passionate about a particular genre, do it. You know, um, you're, you know, you're most likely to be the best at that if that's your, if that's your passion. But man, you never know, you never know where, where the opportunities are going to, are going to come from or what something's going to lead to. I'll give an anecdote speaking to that. Uh, in 2006, I made a record in Cuba uh, with my partner, Cool Kojak. We did a record, the project called Urban Legend, and we recorded like Cuban musicians and Cuban hip hop artists and did a sort of remix project around it. And that wound up by happenstance, you know, leading me down a whole road of working with all kinds of Latin artists when I came back to LA. Um, ultimately, wound up being part of two Latin Grammy winning albums. Uh, most recently was a, was an album with a, with an artist called, um, Alex Cuba. And we got a Latin Grammy for that record as well as uh, a Grammy nomination. I've just been following opportunities as they, as they come along and, and following creativity and doing things that interest me and trying to put them out there the best I can so that, uh, you know, they can get some, you know, the people people know they're out there. Thanks for coming and visiting me in my studio. Thank you, Sound Iron, for the dope samples. You can check me out at jaredfaber.com or online and on all the socials and whatnot. Appreciate it. Thank you.